Sean bienvenidos a este canal informativo. Los invito a suscribirse y activar la campana de notificaciones. Palestina ante la ONU. Esto no es un conflicto. Israel está borrándonos del mapa. La Autoridad Nacional Palestina ha solicitado ante el Consejo de Seguridad de la ONU protección internacional. Por su parte, Israel se ha opuesto frontalmente a un alto al fuego permanente en Gaza con el argumento de que solo servirá para apuntalar el reino de terror de Hamas. No olvide dejar un comentario en este video y un me gusta también para apoyarnos. Muchísimas gracias. El ministro de Exteriores de la Autoridad Palestina ha solicitado ante el Consejo de Seguridad de la ONU protección internacional, ya que considera que lo que ocurre en la franja de Gaza no puede describirse como un conflicto, sino que se trata de una carnicería que nadie puede justificar y a la que es necesario poner fin. El ministro palestino de Exteriores ha aclamado que Israel está borrando del mapa a Palestina, mientras que se queja ante el mundo de que se enfrenta a la advertencia de su propia destrucción. Estamos siendo expulsados de la historia y de la geografía. Así es como ha dicho. ¿Qué opina de esta noticia? Nuevamente los invito a suscribirse y activar la campana, a compartir a través de las redes sociales. Recuerde quedarse hasta el final de este video porque tenemos más información interesante para usted. Gracias por estar acá. Noticias al día. Sí, bueno, vemos que está ahora esta tregua, pero lo que dicen los israelíes es que están dispuestos a prolongar esta tregua que finaliza hoy eh, si jamás sigue con la posibilidad de liberar cada día a 10 rehenes, esto hasta que ya no exista esa posibilidad y entonces dicen en Israel que reanudarán con fuerza su ofensiva para eliminar al movimiento Hamas, dice el primer ministro Benjamin Netanyahu, para impedir que estos terroristas puedan realizar eh, masacres como las del 7 de octubre pasado. Entonces, ahora el ejército israelí se encuentra en el norte de Gaza. Podría comenzar cuando termine esta tregua, dependiendo, como digo, del número de rehenes que sean liberados, eh, entonces se reanudará y entonces aquí el ejército israelí podría comenzar también ofensiva terrestre en el sur de Gaza. Entonces en Estados Unidos llaman a Israel a usar también la experiencia que tienen ellos en lugares como Faluya o Mosul en el interior de Irak, donde había realidades similares eh, para adoptar tácticas que intenten impedir en la medida de lo posible víctimas civiles. Entonces, este ahora es un tema central para Estados Unidos, que es un país que, por un lado, apoya la necesidad de Israel de eliminar al movimiento Hamas, pero por otro querría que su experiencia de combate pueda ser usada por los israelíes para minimizar el número de víctimas inocentes. Nacho. Eh, una más, eh, la, la última, que por supuesto envuelve a todo lo que venimos contando, José, la tregua desde ya y este intercambio de rehenes. Eh, ¿Es posible o no que se extienda esa tregua? Bueno, vemos eh, que existen eh, esfuerzos ahora considerables eh, de sobre todo el país mediador que estos días se está consiguiendo realmente ser el país artífice de todas estas liberaciones, artífices de la ayuda humanitaria, de cientos de camiones que están llegando al interior de Gaza. Hablamos de Qatar, eh, también Egipto está ayudando, Estados Unidos, pero lo que dicen los mediadores cataríes es que ellos esperan hoy poder anunciar que la tregua que tiene por ahora que finalizar hoy se va a extender al menos dos días más. Entonces esto crea bastante esperanza de que eso pueda transformarse en realidad, una esperanza que también fue expresada por el secretario de Estado estadounidense Anthony Blinken, quien está previsto que en los próximos días llegue a Israel. Escuchemos a Blinken. Nos concentramos en hacer lo que podamos para extender la pausa, para que podamos seguir sacando más rehenes y entrando más asistencia humanitaria. Discutiremos con Israel cómo puede lograr su objetivo de garantizar que los ataques terroristas del 7 de octubre nunca vuelvan a suceder, mientras se mantiene una cantidad cada vez mayor de asistencia humanitaria. 
y se minimizan los sufrimientos y las bajas entre los civiles palestinos. Jimmy Pacheco was never supposed to be a part of this conflict, but he walked out of Shamir Hospital, swept up in a war that wasn't his. I really didn't think that they will keep me alive, knowing that they already had killed my employer. Pacheco is from the Philippines, one of tens of thousands of foreign workers who often come as caretakers or farmhands. In kibbutz near Oz, near the Gaza border, he cared for the elderly Amitai Benzvi. The kibbutz was destroyed on October 7th, and Benzvi was murdered. Mati is his brother. Last minute when they, the terrorists went to the house, my brother was thinking, oh, you know, uh, to save Jimmy because he's, he knew that he cannot run. Jimmy said, no, I'll, I'll stay with you because that's what, what I'm doing, you know, that I'm supposed to do. Mati Benzvi says Jimmy Pacheco had become a part of the family. The whole world knows about Jimmy, you know, and that's due to my brother's sons because he was so dear to my brother, you know. The Philippines Embassy in Israel released this video of Pacheco. It is one of the first times we've heard directly from a freed hostage. Regarding losing weight, it is normal that I would be like this because the food they gave was not enough. Pacheco was about to finish his five-year contract in Israel when he was taken hostage. For the Filipino community in Israel, 30,000 strong, the attack of October 7th was deeply personal. Four of their own were killed in the attack. In a surprise move, Hamas has released 17 Thai citizens during the first days of the truce, as well as Jimmy Pacheco. The Philippines ambassador to Israel says four Filipinos were murdered on October 7th and two taken hostage. Most of the Filipino workers uh, chose to stay and uh, they believe that, uh, uh, you know, they've been here for years already, that Israel will, will uh, be able to weather the storm. The sons of the man for whom Pacheco cared met him at the hospital upon his release, a sign of the bond they shared. Soon after Jimmy Pacheco was released, he spoke with his wife, who celebrated the chance to see him again. When I was in Gaza City, I had already lost my faith that I would stay alive and didn't think I would be able to come back to my family. I gathered strength from our Lord and from my kids. In my mind, I knew I could surpass this. Jimmy credits his survival to his faith. He'll head home in a few weeks to his own family in the Philippines, a reunion that'll come just in time for Christmas. Orrin Lieberman, CNN in Tel Aviv. Well, there's hope in Israel as more hostages are expected to be released as part of an extended truce. But the horrors of October 7th are still being uncovered. Israeli police, along with a civil commission, are compiling forensic evidence, video and witness testimony to document cases of rape and sexual violence against women by Hamas. CNN spoke with witnesses to those harrowing events and a warning that the following testimonies are graphic and contain disturbing accounts of sexual violence. First, take a listen to an Israeli paramedic whose unit responded to one massacre site on October 7th at Kibbutz Beri. He did not want to be identified. The doors uh, I open, it's a bedroom. I see two girls, two teenagers, uh, I guess 13 or 14 years old. One is lying on the floor, one is lying on a bed. The one on the floor, she's lying on her stomach. Her pants are pulled down towards her knees. And there's a, a bullet wound on her, the backside of her neck near her head. And there's a puddle of blood around her, her head. And there's remains of, um, of semen on the lower part of her back. Thousands of statements and video clips have been collected, but investigators do not have firsthand testimony, and it's not clear if any victims survived. However, Israeli police say dead bodies brought for identification show trauma consistent with rape and assault. One morgue worker discovered, described what she discovered. The underwear was often bloody. They just, some of them had underwear on that was very bloody. And it, that was very difficult to see also. We also saw most of the people, the women were, were shot at least once in the body, but then they were shot in the head. And they were shot in the head many times. And it often seemed to be gratuitous cruelty, abject cruelty, because it was seemed to have been done just to mutilate them. The women we saw were not just killed, they were, cruelly, cruelly mutilated in many parts of their bodies. Some say those harrowing stories have been ignored by international communities. 
including Ruth Halpern Kadari, Israeli legal scholar who feels completely betrayed by women's rights organizations. She joins me now. As you might expect, our conversation may include graphic and disturbing accounts of sexual violence. Ruth, thank you so much for joining us. This is a very difficult but very important conversation to have. Um, as just a, a citizen and a journalist, listening to what we just played it is quite damning. But as an expert yourself who has been in this field for many years, can you explain to us how sexual violence was used as a weapon of war by Hamas on October 7th against Israeli women? <laughs> Si no te quieres perder de los últimos acontecimientos que pasan en el mundo, suscríbete y activa la campana. Somos Noticias al Día.